Good morning, Jonathan. Good to have you on the call. Ah, good morning. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we were just having, just before this call, we have the issue PR call. Um, and we, we sort of got to about 57 minutes or three minutes till the top of the hour and went, oh no, we have to go to the community call because after we had some problems with Zoom bombing, we had to sort of put various security things in place. One of which is that you have to log in as the host to start the meeting and we haven't figured out how to hand the host off yet very cleanly. Um, so security is hard. Y yes. Um, cool. So we usually take a few minutes to get going, um, usually about five. But in the meantime, um, let me go ahead and put in the chat window the link to the meeting minutes. Feel free to add anything to the agenda if you've got anything. Also, please add yourselves to the meeting minutes um, as an attendee. And we'll probably get going here in about five. Oh, one other thing to be aware of, these meetings are all recorded. The recordings are all being posted semi-automatically to um, YouTube. Um, by semi-automatically, unfortunately, the, the, they're still working out actual automation. And so there's a, a lovely human who is kind enough to do this for us every week. Um, but I, I do hope they manage to automate it soon. So, welcome, Frederick. Hello. So it looks like we got uh, Jonathan uh, Berry here today. Uh, are you still up for doing your uh, presentation today? Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Oh, fantastic. fantastic. <laughs> Is usually not bold, so I'm gonna fix that. Yeah, are you able, if you have any links uh, to any material that you want posted, uh, can you also add them to the agenda? Uh, I've, I've added it there in the, uh, in the document. And if someone can share the uh, document link, that'd be fantastic. And the, for relevant links, um, so for example, for my presentation and the, and the related document I'm kind of going over, should that be in the overall documents? That seems to be like a standard header, or should it be in the individual weekly minutes somewhere? Ah, so yeah, in the in the agenda, um, we have a ah. uh, a section. Yeah, I see your, I see your cursor now. Yeah. Let me go ahead and fix that up a little bit. There we go. Yeah, and the, and if you could update the name, because I just stuck the word presentation, if you can accurately reflect the uh, the name of it. And so all of this, we we keep a, a running tab since the beginning of time on everything that we've spoken about at a, at a macro level. And so this will help people. So if someone says six months ago, oh, that uh, Jonathan Berry presented a really fantastic thing, you can easily go off and find it and work out what day it is and then correlate it to the right network service mesh meeting on YouTube. Make sense. Cool. And uh, the second thing that we have is we're going to talk about VL3 today uh, after the presentation. But don't feel pressured. We can always uh, wrap the conversation tomorrow uh, to next week, or we could push VL3 back to tomorrow or to next week, worst case uh, scenario. 
Uh, and so don't feel pressured like you have to rush or anything uh, to, to get your point across. Uh, and simultaneously, if you made your point and don't feel like you have to continue on if, if you feel it's not effective, because we, we, can, we can fill in the time. So in other words, take the time that you need. Perfect. And, um, one more minor thing that we should um, that we should probably go over. Um, um, Ed, if you can take a look at your Zoom real quick, and then that'll determine one of the spots on the agenda. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think effectively one of the conversations that we've had, things we have had come in is NSM con virtually you. And we've been saying for a, a while now that we're going to follow KubeCon's lead for the 17th to the 20th because we already have the speakers lined up and everything else. But it might be a good idea to um, try and formalize that a little bit more, uh, see if there's someone who's interested in going and, and you know, chatting with the LF about what, you know, with the CNCF about what's involved mechanically, that kind of thing. And then we also had a question about when we're going to open up our CFP for NSM Con North America, uh, 2020 in Boston, hopefully in Boston. Um, you know, hopefully things have settled down by then um, and sort of see, uh, see about that. So those are two questions that have come in on the mailing list. And um, so I've, can... I've added them both to the agenda. Uh, they should be short conversations. At but, least at this uh, stage, yeah. Yeah. And so, and then <clears throat> but I, I want to make sure that we get that, um, that we get some clarity on there because I know a lot of people are asking questions about it and I uh, want to make sure that we're clear as to what actions that we're taking so that people feel uh, feel comfortable with the direction and that they're all uh, informed. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Cool. C communication is key. And um, Okay, so let's get started. So welcome to the next uh, Network Service Mesh meeting. Uh, we hold this particular meeting every Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific time. We are also involved in the CNCF Telecom User Group, which occurs every first Monday at 8 a.m. Pacific and every third Monday at 3 a.m. Pacific. We also participate in the CNCF SIG Network Call, which occurs every first and third Thursday of every month at 11 a.m. Um, the we have links to each of these in the agenda. Um, also, as a reminder, if you could add yourself to the attendees list in the uh, in the group meeting notes, that would be fantastic. Um, we also, so in terms of major events, uh, I had a new event come up. I don't have the exact date yet. Uh, that event is uh, is going to be sometime next week. Uh, I'm going to be giving a talk on Cloud Native Zero Trust for OpenShift Commons. Uh, they host a webinar uh, a few times a week, uh, usually at 9 a.m. Pacific. So I'm aiming, uh, I've asked them for Tuesday at 9 a.m. 9 Pacific. Uh, and uh, that'll be on the, that'll be on their uh, OpenShift Commons webinar. So I will post a message. Uh, I'll I'll post the final link here in the agenda once I get it, and I'll also send a uh, a blast both both on Slack and on the mailing list since um, since uh, they are asking for people to register ahead of time, and we'll do one more blast out uh, next week for people to be aware of when that's on. So that's. Um, that should be next, I think, what, what day is that? I think it's on the 26th, yeah. So that tentatively on the 26th of my, at, uh, 
at uh, 9 a.m. Pacific time. And uh, we also have uh, KubeCon, uh, Con Europe, the uh, virtual experience, which is, um, which is going to be August 17th through 20th. Uh, it will, the call, so all the call for papers is already done. Pay, uh, we, the agenda is already, uh, already out in terms of who's, uh, who's speaking for it. Uh, and it will be hosted uh, virtually. So please sign up for it I, um, if you have not done so already. Uh, simultaneously, if you have not received a, uh, if you signed up for NSMCon, you should have received a, uh, uh, a reversal on your charge uh, for the $50 uh, registration fee. So if you have not received that, uh, the people to contact are the, uh, the CNCF, Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation. If you're having trouble finding the right person to talk with in that scenario, come ask, come ask me on Slack and I will try to find who the right person is so we can work out what's going on there. Uh, we, um, we also are, uh, we also will have NSM or NSMCon and KubeCon EU. So maybe we should uh, just bump that, uh, that particular part here. Um, so we are looking to to drive NSMCon EU still, uh, except it'll be a virtual event. And so there's a lot of there's still a lot of logistics that we need to do from a from a mechanical mechanical perspective. Um, and as far as you know, is there any reason why we would not have an NSMCon EU? Because my understanding is we're still on. We are still on. Cool. So there we go. We're we're still on. And so please, um, please go ahead and uh, what, what we will, what we'll do is we, we will get more information on how we'll host it. Uh, uh, we'll probably end up using Zoom for that since Zoom has a good platform. Uh, and so please, uh, if you're presenting there, please be ready uh, the same, same way you would be beforehand. Uh, this will actually make recording a lot easier. Um, mm -hmm. And so. And, and if, if we have any community volunteers who would be, willing to help with some of the logistics there. I mean, they shouldn't be complicated logistics. It's basically things like, you know, reaching out to the speakers to make sure that they understand how the process is going to work, that this is still happening, um, that kind of stuff. If there's anyone in the community who'd be willing to volunteer to, to help with that, it would be very much appreciated. Um, and um, something I would like to explore, because for me, the, the one of the big things with this is uh, I want to make sure that we have the community aspect as well, because that's the real reason. We can always do these types of talks uh, on these on the weekly meetings and, uh, and have an ongoing set of sessions. But I think the real value in, in these type of things is the social interaction uh, and how to, and getting to meet people. So what I'm so what I'm going to propose to propose is that uh, uh, we also set up a couple slots uh, during when the breaks uh, maybe not like during some of the breaks or during some of the during some of the periods that we we set up slots where we can set up multiple rooms people can promenade from one to the other and just meet meet each other and and talk in a free form environment uh, so I think. That way, yeah. that the community can get to to know each other, because that's for me that that's a huge. Uh, that's a, the that's a the huge the other one I think we probably want to strongly encourage folks to do is to hop on the Slack channel during absolutely because one of the things that I've actually experienced with various of the virtual events that I've been to is um, it's in, you know you get a ton of stuff that goes on in the background, at least that I've experienced personally um, with the Slack channels, right? So you you get a speaker who comes up, they give a talk. As soon as they're done giving the talk. You go and you, you hit them up over Slack and maybe you start a room with other people who want to continue the conversation about the talk. Um, and that can be just profoundly useful. Um, so definitely. And, and this also has the added, uh, the added change of, uh, of not offending the speaker when you're uh, talking on Slack, unlike most conferences. And so uh, please make use of that opportunity. It's, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do the best that we can on our side and make sure that you know, I'll make sure that I'm present myself um, to to help answer questions that as the uh, as the talks go through. So if there's something that's really not clear, uh, and then and I'm, I'm happy to to bring to discuss through some of the more fine de uh, fine grained details of things that I that I can answer. Um, so 
Yeah, so NSMCon EU is still uh, is still on. We will have we will release more details about uh, about it uh, as as time progresses. Um, if you are if you find that you are not able to give a talk for uh, for some reason, like your your you've come down sick or something's happened or, or so on. But also please get a hold of us as well, because then we can, we can work out how to, uh, how to, how to adjust for that as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think in this particular scenario, uh, you know, so I'm so super excited to, to see the, uh, we, we have a very strong set of talks. And so we're, um, so I'm glad to see that we're still going to be able to get those talks out there. Um, we also have, um, ONES North America coming up, um, the, um, which should be in September 28th and 29th. Uh, as far as I know, that has not been postponed. Uh, ONES Europe has been postponed, uh, and I have not seen any literature come out on that just yet. So when I see any information come out on that, I will let you all know. Uh, but considering uh, they've been pushing back events in, in the EU, I seriously doubt that it'll be in uh, uh, that, that we're going to that we're going to see it uh, uh, in in a an actual physical event at this point. Uh, KubeCon North America is still on as normal. Uh, please get your talks in. You are running out of time if you're not submitted already. Uh, the CFP closes in June twelfth. Um, there are no major announcements that uh, that have been posted at this point. So, in terms of social uh, community uh, stats, um, this particular week, in terms of followers, is um, has been no change in status. We still have 761 followers. We are now following 2,297, and we have uh, 1,285 retweets, tweets, and retweets that we have done. We've posted call reminders, the last week's video recap, the CNCF weekly webinars. Uh, we also have various save the date events, such as the virtual LFN and testing forum and the, reg the registration for virtual KubeCon. Uh, we also have retweeted the Linux Foundation training, VMware open source work, more telecom TV stuff, um, more things related towards the cloud native survey and the CNF testbed. We've also posted links here, so if you're interested in any of those topics, you can see them on the agenda. We LinkedIn stats, we've also added two followers. So we recently started our LinkedIn account and we now have 158 content, post the exact same thing as Twitter. So if you don't like the noise of Twitter, uh, you can follow the stream on LinkedIn. Uh, we also plan to retweet uh, the NSMCon EU uh, promoting registration and share more information about uh, NSM as things go past. And uh, with that, uh, let's see, we've already covered in the main agenda, we've already covered NSM, NSM Con EU. Uh, NSM Con US, is there anything that we want to say about that in the, in the agenda? Um, I, I, so effectively, I, I, I expect we probably will have an NSMCon US, but we are just starting starting to, to plan that because of all the disruption. Um, so I, I think it is something we should probably um, work out. If we do have members of the community who would like to volunteer to be part of that planning process, that would be fantastic. Um, you know, historically, um, you know, historically, you know, various the, the maintainers and committers have done a lot of that heavy lifting and we're certainly willing to continue to do so. But sort of broadening the base of people who are working on it can only be a good thing. Cool, and I'll, um, I'll see if I can find some, uh, some potential volunteers as well in, uh, in some of the people who are not present. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this is a, these type of things are primarily around uh, just from a from a work uh, scope perspective. Uh, they can be at different levels. Like we have uh, like any help that we'll take. I mean, even if it's just like uh, responding to the questions or or so on. Uh, but generally, the 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 planning uh, the planning around this uh, is is something that uh, the the last KubeCon that we did. Uh, was fantastic because of the because of the planners and it was definitely a special thanks to the people from 
both uh, Cisco and, uh, and VMware who uh, joined forces to, uh, to make it happen. Uh, very rare joining of forces. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they were absolutely fantastic with each other, great synergy. And so we're, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a good way to, to also meet new friends as well. Um, in terms, okay, so in that scenario, uh, our next item is uh, with Jonathan Barry, Barry moving beyond HTTP of serving the state of L7 protocols and cloud native uh, ecosystem. So you should be able to share your screen. Uh, if you're having trouble, let us know. All right, let's, uh, let's get my audio on and... Yep, we can hear you, you've got the floor. All right, how does that look? Looks good. Okay, so um, quick background on, on the presentation um, and I'll go into the details in a moment. Um, I presented this at the, the, uh, the Network SIG a few weeks ago and Ed was there. Um, the slides were about 10 minutes worth of content and 30 minutes of discussion, which was awesome. That's kind of the reason why I gave the presentation and uh, Ed suggested uh, that I present similar content here um, because there's also opportunity to, to research um, basically lower than L7. Uh, so anyway, if you've watched the recording of the video from, from the network SIG or saw my slides earlier, this is largely the same. Um, hopefully the discussion uh, areas are, are going to be different. Um, so uh, feel free to jump in at any time, either over audio or uh, in the, um, the Slack, uh, sorry, the Zoom chat. Uh, I won't have that open, but someone can definitely, uh, I'll see the notification. So, uh, you know, overall, um, this is around networking um, and some work I've been doing that started out as uh, work for my own startup, um, but really I hope to improve the overall ecosystem as a result of the discussions like this. So quick about me, um, my background is, is product management uh, on developer platforms. I worked at companies like Google and Nest uh, and to startups and everything in between. Uh, I'm currently working on my own startup um, and uh, I'm, I'm very active on Twitter. Uh, the, my Twitter handle is Barry Barry Kicks. If you're, if you're familiar enough with that serial, that's really the whole story. But uh, nonetheless, um, I, I also have my email I put in the, in the notes. So uh, I mentioned I work on an IoT platform. This is super high level what an IoT platform is. Um, it has a bunch of different uh, device messaging uh, capabilities with protocols, uh, security updates. Um, but really, uh, in, you know, the, the things that are really interesting for this group is around um, the communication between, let's say, a, a thing and, and the platform in between. And, and to zoom in, it's really the device messaging component that I'm most interested in. But uh, as it relates to this overall survey, um, that's just one type of, of networking protocol that is really interesting for us. So um, as it comes into IoT, and if, if I'm, I'm assuming there's a broad uh, audience here, um, there's actually a ton of different protocols. Many of them are IP bearing. And uh, as a small startup, um, we are picking one or two protocols to begin with, but eventually we want to support multiple protocols. And th that requires us to have a networking infrastructure in place that enables us to do that. Um, and uh, you know, one of the challenges of today is a lot of platforms pick one and, and then sort of only focus on that. So um, this is really the preamble of why I start to look into networking protocols uh, in general and, and, and cloud native protocol implementations. Um, this is our, our, our initial architecture, right? We have a, a device um, on the left. Um, it's communicating with our cloud infrastructure on the right. It's using one of these IoT protocols, which is a UDP-based protocol, to send you know, telemetry data and, and control data back and forth. Um, and most of the logic lives in the gateway. This gateway is, is an ap application we built ourselves. It speaks this protocol, and it's effectively communicating to um, backend services uh, that handle the response. This is pretty typical. I think nothing special and nothing fancy. Um, the actual architecture itself, though, is while it's on Kubernetes, it's, it's actually not Kubernetes native at all. It, effectively, it's, it's a VM. Um, it's actually a container, but it's also running the same application on our desktop. So we're, we're not quite cloud native here. And over time, we want to move to more cloud native architecture, uh, leveraging things like uh, proxies and uh, across the network um, service meshes and things like that. And so this is sort of the way we think about uh, evolving into a more cloud native way. And, I, and I, I think it maps to a lot of other applications that are moving from a non-cloud native uh, architecture to a more cloud native one. And eventually you wanna be able to leverage the, the full ecosystem um, and have things like uh, serverless and, and even functions of service. And, and that's kind of the genesis of looking at multiple projects and how they implement networking and, and different protocols at different layers. And so um, for us, the first step was to take our gateway and 
implement you know, either as part of Envoy or, or wrap Envoy around it. Um, and about a year ago is when we started looking into it. Uh, and this is the, the issue I, I raised uh, on the Envoy team. Well, um, looking at how L7 protocols are implemented in Envoy, actually, they're not super well supported. HTTP is very well supported, and that makes sense because the primary workload of applications in, within a cluster are, are HTTP. Um, and actually, even UDP wasn't implemented at the time. And it raised this question, um, you know, specifically in Envoy, but you know, became the question I started asking over and over again is, how do you implement an L7 protocol as a first class uh, protocol? Um, and by first class in this context really means at the same level of capabilities as HTTP. Um, and what I came away with uh, after having really good conversations with the Envoy community is broadly speaking, the cloud native landscape is optimized for HTTP. You know, we can all agree that makes sense. Um, but as a result, projects from Kubernetes all the way down to individual projects that are being spun up um, right now have a lot of assumptions around the networking, uh, you know, so the data plane and, and even the control plane uh, that the traffic is HTTP. Um, so that has challenges for people who want to implement non HTTP protocols. And uh, because I was looking at IoT, uh, a lot of my use cases are really around different IoT protocols and, and ways those are implemented. But through discovering and, and through chatting with the community, there's actually a whole other domains that had that same problem. The problem in that they are not running HTTP protocols and they need to optimize in, in different ways. So one big uh, category is gaming. Um, a project at Gonus is a project actually from Google. Um, it's the game serving infrastructure that's built in, on and extends uh, Kubernetes. Uh, they use, uh, in the gaming industry, they use protocols uh, for um, game state synchronization or real-time communication. Um, that's obviously not HTTP. And today they don't really have a good solution. Um, you know, Gonus itself, they don't have it built in. They just manage the game servers on Kubernetes and say, hey, it's up to you to figure out how to do game state and other, uh, other game um, infrastructure components, which they would love to support. Um, I also mentioned real-time communication, uh, and uh, one in particular is WebRTC, and we're using it to some degree in this Zoom call, but uh, many other companies use it as their full solution. Uh, Pion is a uh, is a really cool project. It's a it's a whole suite of packages. Um, it's written in Go, so it's a, a native project, um, and uh, you know they're looking into how do they actually run this on on uh, infrastructure like uh, Kubernetes. Um, the creator Sean and the project lead is looking into how do you do, uh, for example, load balancing uh, for WebRTC video traffic on Kubernetes. That's really an uncharted territory and it's usually solved proprietary and out of bounds. Um, so what I left, uh, what I came away with is, is that not only is this useful for you know, IoT and, and the project I'm working on, but rather uh, the community at large. Um, and so I started this working doc, which uh, ooh, got really blurry in the screenshot, um, but uh, there's the bit.ly link. It's, it's bit.ly slash um, alt L7 NSM uh, for, for those who, are, or, who can't click through it. Um, and this is the sort of the outcome of these efforts. And uh, I put together this doc you know, almost as a small presentation for the Envoy um, uh, steering committee, uh, which is now snowballed into surveying um, all the related projects, a, a, a different implementers might want to leverage uh, using the cloud native ecosystem and how and where effectively L7 protocols are implemented or make it hard to implement uh, alternative protocols. And so this is the, the crux of, of this work and it's an ongoing living document. Um, I've uh, had the opportunity to get uh, either core contributors or project leads to, to expand or explain or correct my mistakes of, of my survey for their particular project. And so it's quite useful at this point, and it's been either um, validating some of the ongoing um, caps, if there are caps, or um, open issues for those maintainers who actually want to solve those issues, or just highlighting uh, future uh, initiatives that, that may, um, may be more interesting for the different project maintainers and, and as they're evaluating uh, their roadmaps. Uh, and uh, my goal now is well beyond the startup I'm working on in IoT is, is to make it easy to, to do the uh, easy things and, and make the hard things possible when it comes to implementing custom protocols. And um, you know, here's an example. Uh, if you haven't opened up the doc yet, um, it's quite maybe relevant to this group um, of the type of analysis. It's very high level because really we're trying to understand is as an application developer, how can I leverage this project? Um, so uh, SMI is a service mesh interface. Um, and just as a quick uh, overview, 
uh, each resource in the SMI has this concept of a traffic um, spec, um, and that traffic spec allows you to define new protocols. And even in the, in the, in the definition of it, it says each resource in the specification is meant to match one-to-one -one with a specific protocol. This allows users to define the traffic in a protocol-specific uh, fashion. So the takeaway uh, for people who want to implement uh, alternative protocols is SMI should be able to support alternative protocols using their own traffic specs. Um, and so that's the document is, is meant to go uh, project by project and highlight the opportunities for improvement or uh, you know, effectively, hey, go ahead and use, use this in, in, to build your, your own protocol. Um, and and this, this is really the, the end of the, of the presentation because most of the, the, the networking team conversation was around these discussion points. Um, and uh, you know, Ed really highlighted to me how there's opportunity here. Um, and, I, and I've dug in NSM to maybe raise some more uh, discussion points to, to get feedback from, from this group. Um, you know, the first one is, uh, oh, make sure you, you, you check out the doc and, and please leave any comments. It's open for comments. Um, as it relates to the network service mesh, uh, where does that um, connect with L7 protocols? Um, just as the sort of current vision of uh, enabling these, these application protocols to, to work. Um, one example, and, and um, I can I will speak to it a little bit more, um, is this, uh, well, um, a common architecture, this is IoT specific, is maybe you have your device services and your application services. So um, an IoT device communicates directly with something like our gateway, but maybe that's a more uh, robust and sophisticated um, set of services where your application team is building the functionality to handle that. Um, from a commercial perspective, uh, we're seeing companies who actually want us to have a managed device cluster uh, that they can that we can run and operate um, within their own um, deployment, and they their application team has their own uh, application customer. That's really interesting from a cluster to cluster communication, but also from a a managed uh, VPC like uh, business model. Um, I think there might be some opportunity to to leverage NSM there. Um, a, a, another one which is is actually related um, but different uh, for IoT deployments that are maybe not clusters, maybe not Kubernetes. Uh, so imagine a local network or a, um, you know, a gateway uh, a deployed network. That's one uh, domain, uh, one network domain, trying to communicate with a, uh, either another uh, on-premise cluster or the cloud. I think there's these sort of cross-domain networking challenges that um, I, I know from experience are very hard to implement and very one-off as they exist today, especially across different protocols. Um, the other area is, uh, as implementers of these protocols, uh, what are the concerns that maybe dip below the actual application protocol into the L4 to, to L2 domain, uh, sorry, uh, layer? Um, you know, whether it's uh, routing, uh, load balancing, congestion control, uh, it might make sense to implement those, uh, you know, at, at L4, L3 at the very least, um, so that different protocols don't have to think about those, those type of concerns. Um, and uh, the last, and this is, I think, one, one last thing that Ed and I discussed was, you know, what about non-IP protocols? I mentioned um, IoT, there's, there's a bunch of IP-bearing protocols, but there are also non-IP protocols. And I think some of this touches on the, the telco use case, um, but uh, also non-network. Uh, um, so in, in the world of IoT, we have what's called low-power wide area networks, or LPWANs, and they use such small bit rates to save on battery and, and, and data uh, that they can't even fit into an IP headers. Um, and so they're running on these non-IP um, non layers, and so how do those mesh into or connect into, um, let's say, an IP-based uh, cluster? So um, smattering of, of, of opportunities, I, I think, and I would love to just get feedback on the overall uh, presentation, but um, maybe dig into some of these specific ones that might be relevant to, to this group. And if there's any questions, uh, now would be a great time to, to pop in. No, this, is, this is all very cool, because this, this, these are exactly the kinds of things we were hoping <clears throat> that would be. So, when you're trying to build something that's going to be somewhat generalizable, you sort of imagine what the, the problems in the world look like, right? And we had a whole set of problems that we had ima imagined for the IoT world. Um, and, and as you're well aware, uh, real problems are real, not imaginary. Um, <clears throat> and, and so while I don't think we did a perfect job of imagining the problems that IoT has, from your description, um, we're, we weren't terribly far off. And so some of the architectural white space that we left in the hopes that we could help out the IoT world, um, it looks like you know we 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 have some of that space here for you guys, right? Because you you sort of are the you know one of the things that you know we've always sort of pointed out is 
if your if your problem is shaped like HTTP, please go talk to the the Envoy or the Istio or the Kuma or the um, Linkerd people because they've done a killer job of that, right? They, they've done a really good work. But if your problem is not shaped like HTTP, um, then maybe just maybe uh, you might need something that is not focused on it. Yeah. And it sounds like you've got a giant pile of not shaped like HTTP. <laughs> yeah, and, and the tendency for prior implementations is to you know do protocol translation marshaling at, at the edge at, at the edge of the cloud um, and you lose a lot of capabilities that way but also performance um, becomes a real issue as you as you start to scale um, so there's this desire um, from a performance complexity whatever you want to call it to basically keep those uh, uh, IP bearing protocols native all the way through to the end application because you can right like if you're writing go or Python you can take an HTTP, an IP header and, and do whatever you want with it um, in, in prior, uh, prior companies, there's a humongous um, cost benefit and various forms of cost when you, you, you can kind of be um, without having to do that marshalling and arm marshalling. Um, and so, yeah, and, and, and looking at the NSM uh, vision and current working uh, direction, it's, it's well aligned with, with IoT. And again, those non-IoT use cases still have these same problems or, or, or challenges that are not HTTP. Um, and I think the moment you, you, you're saying about the practical deployments, uh, it'll likely be a mix of it because, it'll, because your application will have HTTP uh, functionality, which is probably your public API or, or some other parts of your serving infrastructure, and then your, your non HTTP components. So this, let's take a WebRTC um, deployment. A lot of that cap um, it, um, traffic that's going in and out uh, is serving the application and the UI and um, the, you know, client, uh, fat client that talks to the back end. But then there's also a secondary channel, which is serving the real-time communication for chat and state sync and video stream. So now you have to actually manage both HTTP and non-HTTP uh, protocols and uh, scaling that and load balancing and failover, like yeah. all those complexities. Oh yeah, no, it, it's, it's, it's super hard for all of us as we sit here with our iPhones that, that literally have supercomputer level powers to imagine how resource constrained IoT can get. Yeah. Um, I mean, the other one that, that sort of strikes me is if you can do a more intelligent job of slicing some of these things at the administrative level uh, to reduce friction, there's a whole world of business possibilities that open up in IoT. So for example, let's say that I'm the vendor of XYZ industrial widget, right? And one of the things I will offer is a service contract where so long as my, the XYZ industrial widget can be backhauled to my, to my as the widget providers monitoring system, um, I will actually monitor it for you. And more than that, when, I, when it starts sending me wonky information, um, I will send someone out to your site with a replacement who can install it for you. I mean, this is sort of like, uh, one of the things that really impressed me, and this was literally circa 2000, was the NetApp guys really nailed this with storage, because if they sold you a filer, like, and, and one of those just started getting wonky, this was in 2000. Yeah. You would get an email from them that said, Disk 43 on shelf 12 is wonky. Um, we could have someone there tomorrow morning to replace it. Is that okay with you? Yep. yep. And, yeah, and, and, uh, <laughs> and some of the sensors are super sensitive. I had a, I had a friend who, who said uh, he worked out um, that he, he, he had a friend who said, hey, come over here. Let me show you something. And so he walked up to, a, uh, to an array of, of, uh, of hard drives. I think it was, uh, I forget which company it was, but it was like, one of the, the high-end storage solutions. And he says, watch, I can make all the lights on, my, uh, on the storage server go, go turn on at the same time. And he yelled at the box and all the lights go on, pegs 100% CPU, network's pegged at 100% on that system. And the whole cluster like lights up and then it cools down again. And we worked out that what it was is the sensors on the hard drive were sensitive enough that when you yelled at it, it said, oh, something's really weird with this box. I better ship the data off of it before it goes back. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, but you can see where, like, if you can, you know, if you can make these things low latency, you know, low, low, low friction, like all kinds of cool shit. Yeah, and so you know, first, first use case is uh, I'm sending everything, um, everything to your backend, um, to our backend or your backend, it doesn't matter. Um, someone has to manage the uh, the network, uh, the network connectivity and the security, uh, and that's that's basically what um, people are willing to pay for. Uh, so you imagine um, securing a device that maybe has 120K of RAM and 64 megahertz, and that communication from that device to some, some gateway or the cloud, 
and then the data in transit and the data at rest and then before it actually gets to the thing you you're processing the data um, super complicated and you want to make sure you get that right um, and so you know the friction is literally people want to make that boring and just say hey give me give me the the api that will spit the data out um, into something i can and operate and so this is the sort of device cluster versus app cluster scenario um, <laughs> you 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 th thank you by the way for that comment about boring um, I, I, I'm sort of like the first thought that came to my mind is I need to give a talk at some point where the, the first slide is I have come to make your networking boring. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, what, what, I keep on saying that phrase over and over in a lot of my meetings because I think Kelsey Hightower was, said it, uh, was, was talking about Kubernetes recently and it says, you know, uh, I really hope it's boring. Uh, I really hope we get to that point. Um, and, you know, we'll still have jobs and we'll be, we'll be great, but no one will be so um, frustrated about using it or making mistakes about using it or, or, or um, trying to find a vendor uh, of how to use it. Um, and, I, and, I, and I actually hope networking gets to that point um, where there's, there's still there's, healthy. There's, yeah. Oh, yeah. There, there's this beautiful. So if you haven't read the, the technical oversight committee of the CNCF's cloud native definition, um, there, there's a beautiful term in there. Um, and I, I and effectively the term is minimal toil. And that is just such a perfect term for where we want to get, right? And minimal toil is not just like how, much, how many buttons you have to push. It's also how much you have to think. Um, yeah, and, and you know, I think with the history of HTTP and uh, network administration within um, you know, virtual machine infrastructure and co you know, colos and virtual machine infrastructure, um, we have a lot of experience uh, in that regard. Um, we have very little uh, as it goes beyond sort of HTTP traffic and workloads. Um, and uh, I certainly don't know how to uh, bridge that gap, but there's a lot of parallels in the kinds of things we want to do with non HTTP traffic. Um, and again, like IoT protocols and other protocols. And I think um, thinking at it from this networks, uh, network service layer um, and how do we bridge these different domains and things like that. Um, are a, a key piece to solving that and, and getting to the point mm -hmm. where it's boring and, and, and less toil. Um, and, you know, I, kind of summary, I, I don't know how to, how to um, best leverage uh, the work everyone's doing here and how to participate in, 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 in help uh, the ecosystem. But I, I can see it's the same thing with, for example, um, well, at, the, at the L7 layer. So, so we, we, we at one point had a use case that the, the telco guys did a use case working group in network service mesh at one point. And I'm not suggesting you go start an IoT uh, working group for a network service mesh. But if we could identify sort of one low hanging fruit use case, um, that might be a good place to start, right? Like what's the, what's the single simplest use case we can think of uh, with the biggest bang for the buck here? Because that gives us something to go and aim at, right? Um, because you, your, your problem in IoT is that you have an abundance of, of riches of problems to solve. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I mean, you, you finally solved the one of them, which is how to handle the marketing. Um, you know, I, 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 I've occasionally talked to IoT, because like when you had, once the, you had the IoT term, suddenly it was a thing. Yeah. Um, I've had hysterical conversations with some IoT vendors at one point who have occasionally grumbled that they've been doing this for 40 years now. And then suddenly there's a marketing term that works and now everyone's excited. Um. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, I think network service mesh and, and service mesh are, are great ones to latch on to, uh, at least oh, yeah. for, for now. Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Uh, even from our own uh, product offering, we're focusing on one protocol with one very specific use case uh, as it relates to um, the core, um, core infrastructure. And I think that can be extended um, to a, a network service mesh. Uh, yep, sounds the, great. And yeah, that no, can that, take that, that offline. Yeah, we definitely um, take that offline. And, and, you know, that conversation, I mean, you know, we, we would love to have as much of the conversation in public as we can, but, but I do understand that that's not always possible when one is working for a startup. Fortunately, uh, we can make this public. Perfect. Cool. I think that's, that's really it uh, for me. Um, and like I said, I'm actually in the, the Slack now. So uh, if anyone wants to follow up me um, there uh, uh, or, or in this chat, so. Thanks for the opportunity to share. Cool. Thank you so yeah, much for coming you. out. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah. Th thanks for thanks for presenting. This is fantastic. Um, so the the next topic uh, was on the uh, was on the VL3 stuff because we had some questions about VL3 last uh, uh, last week. And so, in terms of uh, VL3, are we able to get the uh, uh, the 
the, this morning there was a really beautiful graphic that was uh, that was in the uh, uh, in the contributors meeting. Uh, can we bring that uh, that graphic up and share it? I, I'm not sure where it was uh, stored at. I'm sorry, which graphic? The uh, the VL three one that uh, that was shown off with the uh, the three uh, clusters. Oh, Denise, could you bring that up and share it? Is that something you you're able to do? It's your diagram. Oh, yep. Let me a second. Yeah, this was a diagram that was shared in the issues in PR meeting that happens the half hour before this, and it was super happy making. It's a really well done diagram. Yep, uh, I have uh, provided some uh, diagrams for VL3. Uh, if you have some thoughts or ideas, uh, you're welcome uh, to comment. Um, and uh, mostly uh, we have uh, uh, two diagrams. For example, uh, here is uh, abstract diagram of uh, basic VL3 NC case. And also we have a uh, uh, valid uh, use case of uh, deploy VL3 NC. And uh, also um, mostly I working in two directions with this issue. Um, as you know, uh, VL3 uh, depends on some stuff like interdomain and floating interdomain. And uh, currently we are uh, moving to a uh, new uh, SDK style. And my first direction is moving and adapting features from monorepo to SDK. Uh, and uh, here, uh, is a diagram of uh, dependencies and uh, current status of each uh, dependency. And also uh, you can find uh, here some uh, links to issues and PRs. Uh, and uh, mostly that's it. If, if you have any ideas or thoughts, questions, uh, you're welcome. Yeah, if, if you can uh, just uh, show the uh, the image and leave it there for a moment, because uh, I want people to get a sense as to what we're what we're looking to to build in the initial virtual three uh, component, because we had some we had some questions on it uh, that uh, uh, that people had, and so what we're looking to um, uh, sorry, not this one, the uh, the the previous one that you had shown, the uh, the one with the, the the graph, yeah. So, so this particular one, what we're showing off is uh, three clusters, and each of the three clusters has a series of, uh, of applications that uh, that are on them. And so, what we do is, in the general, what we generally do is every cluster historically gets its own registry. And this registry keeps track of where all the number of services within that cluster is. And so one of the things that we're that we're able to do is that registry API, uh, one of the one of the, the first things that we did when we were creating network service mesh was we came to the realization that that registry may actually live in other locations and there's benefits to having to having it like that. And so that uh, API is actually a gRPC. So right, yes, it does get back by CRDs and the reference implementation for a single cluster, but you could uh, extract that out. And since it's a gRPC call, you can, uh, you can back that with, uh, with something else. And so in this scenario, we make a floating registry that is capable of tracking where the variety of services are amongst the, uh, the cluster and then is able to coordinate the connection between the network service clients and endpoints as they, uh, as they need to communicate across the variety of clusters. Now, the second thing 
that uh, is not really seen in this scenario is that the connections that we're making uh, have we we have the capability to drive this in uh, in a few directions, and so it's not like it's a rigid shape. And so we can, if you want to plug in a service that is a subnet, uh, that's uh, certainly possible. Uh, simultaneously, if you want to connect a point to point, like maybe you have two databases, one is in like domain one and the other is domain two, and a third database in domain three and you wanted to do synchronization between them all uh, in replication, uh, then you could also set up point-to-point uh, -point links between them as well uh, so that they all will communicate directly with each other and perform that replication um, with, uh, without having to worry about the subnetting of the rest of the system. And so we, uh, I've already written, it's called a point-to-point -point ICAM. So we wrote a point-to-point -point IPAM that is capable of assigning IP addresses uh, that uh, is based upon what that specific uh, set of services is, cur is currently using and uh, based upon what the, remote, uh, what the remote end is using and trying to find something that I uh, can correlate between the two of them that only takes into consideration the minimum set of, uh, of networks that are touched. And in this scenario, it's uh, if you have two pods, it's what what subnets should I not interfere with on pod one, and what subnets should I not interfere with on pod two, and to give you flexibility on how to drive that. Um, another thing that we're adding in as well is uh, we also have the capability to journal what decisions were made on the IPAM side, and we separated that out from the actual IPAM itself because then by doing journaling, that gives you the capability to get observability on what your your IPAM decision is, uh, makes. And if your IPAM ever fails, it then gives you the capability to replay the uh, decisions made in order to recover the IPAM if your IPAM does not have that information in its, in its recovery. Um, and so, uh, of course, if you have an IPAM that solves those problems as well, you can just leave those out. The other thing that is not shown in this, um, but is uh, something that we are that we've done some work on, is uh, DNS. And so, anytime anyone shows you a L3 interdomain uh, solution, always ask about DNS because that is one of the that's one of the harder things to to solve. And one of the things that we have is we have upstreamed the core DNS uh, a, a fan out uh, plugin that allows you to, to add and remove DNS uh, entries. And what we'll do is we will pass in uh, DNS information through the context. So that way that you're able to, uh, to establish your DNS connections and uh, remove them when the services go away. So, uh, so this is just a small taste of, of what we are currently building uh, in order to establish the, uh, the virtual L3 path. And because, because we're trying to minimize, uh, we're trying to, to reduce global state into local state, then from a scalability perspective, this, should, uh, this solution should uh, work out a lot better as we add more and more clusters. And so you know, specifically when you start looking at things like how do you resolve subnet conflicts uh, and how do you resolve routing, the, routing conflicts be between them. And so as, as you add more systems on here, uh, if most of your connections uh, are kept to this, to the, um, to connecting to the things that they actually need to connect to, then we don't have to worry about the the conflict side and in terms of how it uh, to to the to the same degree because we only have to look at conflicts in relationship to two workloads. Um, so. Uh, I've also, in, in relation to, to some of this work, uh, we've been uh, migrating a bunch of stuff off of the, uh, off of the mono repo into the, into the SDK. So this is a work in uh, progress. Once the SDK is, um, is in a uh, good state, then we should, have, um, we should have all of these services uh, ran through the SDK itself. So this means things like IPAM become pluggable. You can compose the, the uh, IPAM 
using the SDK, which respects the network service mesh uh, API, uh, implements the network service mesh API in order to add in things like IPAM, DNS support. And this will give you the capability to take what we've written and you can, you can compose things from the reference implementation, compose them with things that are within your infrastructure. So if you, if you want to use something, other, a different data plane other than uh, VPP, you can swap that out. If you want to use your own IPAM or maybe you have a DNS solution, you can swap all of these things out for the things that you need and uh, wire in the components that uh, from the reference implementation uh, that uh, suit your needs and uh, build up a solution that uh, that uh, meets your that meets your needs at a very fine grained level. If you, uh, if the if for some reason the uh, reference implementation does not meet your your requirements, or if you're a vendor who wants to to uh, provide solutions to your customers, and while still remaining compatible with the rest of the network service mesh uh, ecosystem, including things like the zero trust uh, uh, approach that we've been uh, that we've been uh, working towards, and being able to work in the heterogeneous environment. So, um, as as time progresses, we'll we'll provide more information in detail about uh, about each of these components and how they work. And uh, many of them are already built, but are currently uh, in the process of being uh, of, of being tested and in the process of being uh, of uh, of being uh, exercised. So, if this is something that you would also like to help out with, definitely get a hold of uh, me and Ed, and we will help you with uh, working out where the gaps are that you can that you can help. Um, are there any questions on this? I had a quick one. We don't have much time, so if you can just quickly answer. So back sure. in the days when when this was first presented, when the first NSM come, uh, uh, the problem was, and I'm pointing here on my screen, but I will try to describe it. So the link between the VPPs in domain one and two, and uh, you know, uh, also the same with uh, between one and uh, three and uh, two and three. Uh, is this a VPP managed connection? I would assume so because there's a PNSM manager between them. And then, if so, uh, which one is the client and which one is the endpoint? How do you solve that? For the the VL3 NSEs? Uh, no, the 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 red link between the VPPs in the two do domains. So mm -hmm. between uh, one and two, which one is the client? Ah, so th this is the interesting part. That's going to depend very much on which VL3 NSE came, came up first. Okay. So imagine that you've got that, that, that basically domain two and domain three are already up and going concerns and domain one's VL3 NSE comes up, right? It's going to basically look around and say, okay, what are the other VL3? It'll go ask the floating registry. What, who, who all is providing the, the VL3 interconnected network service that I need to go talk to? <clears throat> and it will find the VL3 VL is for MSC domain two and domain three, and it will go and send a request to them and say, hey, I'd like a connection. So in that case, domain one would be the client. But if a domain four came up after both of those, it would then be the client to the others in, in, in stringing up the interconnect. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. <laughs> Sorry, it was me. Okay. No, no, no. Like it's it's a super good question. It's a really good question. Um, well, <laughs> it was the big problem that was never. I mean, like, uh, I'm I'm happy if this if this gets answered uh, today because uh, before that we we were not able to. But uh, I'm guessing that somehow with the advancements in the you know this multi domain that actually is happening is um, yeah we were able to. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, there's, there's definitely gaps in here that we're gonna have to answer as we progress forward and we'll adjust those as we, as we build it out as well. But uh, in a nutshell, like from all the iterations that we've done, this is where we're, this is where we're currently uh, building towards.
And so the key behind it uh, is really that floating registry in the middle ties it all together. And I'll see about, I, I did a demo for, uh, uh, for an internal customer uh, that showed off some inner domain stuff with, uh, with NSM and I'm, uh, I'm, I'll probably reproduce that, uh, that demo outside. And so that way that you can all see what, uh, uh, how, uh, how you can connect multiple clusters together. Uh, once, uh, once I get some of the, uh, once I get a little bit further on with the SDK, but the, what ended up happening was I ended up sharing uh, I ended up manually copying over to the description of the network service, the network service endpoint, and the network service manager to the second cluster. And then when I performed the connection, then the connection just worked. And so that registry is uh, really the key behind it because we can, we can have that registry act as the anchor that uh, binds all three of them together uh, or more and provides the... Uh, and provides enough context for the uh, for bootstrapping the uh, the connections. And so, well, and the the other thing that's kind of cool here to realize is like it, it looks like there are various components here in the system, right? But if you look at things like the proxy network service managers, so in just the same way that the network service manager on a Kubernetes node is effectively managing the local environment for the clients and the endpoints that are running on that node, and allowing them to communicate with the outside world. The proxy network service manager is doing a similar sort of behavior, but for the entire domain, right? So maybe your domain is running um, on some industrial site <laughs> that is behind some funky firewall. And in order to actually connect to network services that are outside that, you're going to have to go twiddle the firewall. That's the kind of thing the proxy network service manager would be doing um, in that world. Cool. Well, we are at the top of the hour, and so um, if, if if people would like to see more on this, uh, definitely uh, ping us, and we can go more in depth in some of the components uh, next week or the week after. Um, and um, with that, we'll go ahead and close it up. Uh, thank you all for attending, and uh, we will see you all next week.